Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Wandering Road Podcast. I'm your host Chris, alongside my co-host Dean, and joining us for today's show is Dave Griffith, a paranormal investigator, podcast host on the Paranormal Rundown, and future host of the Confronting Evil Podcast. How are you doing tonight, Dave? Doing great. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited. I've been talking with you a, a little bit offline of things that we could cover, and Dean and I are super excited to get this conversation started. Yeah, we were kind of talking before we jumped on, and it um, seems like we have a pretty wide net of different topics to discuss. So like, I'm really, I'm really interested to see where this conversation goes. Dave, the first thing I want to ask you is, why don't you go into your own paranormal experiences, starting with the earliest that you could remember? The earliest I can remember. Well, I didn't have a ton of paranormal experiences growing up. Uh, I think when I got into my late teens, early 20s, ran into a couple of things. I had a, a, I spent a lot of time in the woods growing up camping, hunting, and between Virginia, California, a bunch of different places. I did have an experience in Mendocino National Forest. Uh, I was up camping with a buddy, and we were we were in this just, it was sort of like a ring of trees, big ring of trees with a just a campfire in the middle of it, and a picnic table. And we were sitting around the fire. And it was like one of those something is watching us feelings. And but it was really intense and it was really sort of negative, like this bad feeling. And we could like close our eyes and we'd point and we'd both be pointing wherever this thing was. It was just circling around us. And I had really, really intense dreams while uh, that night. And it was so bad that we actually moved campgrounds. We went somewhere else. And I look back at that now and I think, you know, maybe that was something with uh, Native American or, you know, (laughs) I listen to all kinds of podcasts. You know, maybe it was a Sasquatch thing. I I have no idea. Uh, It could have been demonic. The, The feeling might have lined up with demonic given that intense sort of negative feel. But I, other than that, um, not a whole lot. The I think my wife is my wife Laura. She's pretty sure, and I look back on it that we lived in a rental house in in Florida once that was uh, probably haunted. Sort of the things that would happen in there: cold spots, intense emotion swings, stuff like that that you get when you have a, a haunting. Uh, the kids seeing stuff. My my youngest son uh, was was there, and he would see stuff. And he was like two and a half, three years old. He had a you know an imaginary friend that had a really weird name that uh, came out of nowhere. But I don't know, maybe. But it wasn't until we were. It was back in two thousand ten that. You know, my wife looked at me, we were watching Ghost Hunters, and she's like, you know, I think I'd like to do that. And I'm like, really? (laughs) And so she found a group and we got started, uh, took a class in it and everything, got started ghost hunting. And then it's lots of experiences since then. So I'm not one of these people that like, you know, I grew up in a haunted house, not like JJ or anything, you know, I no haunted cabin with creepy pictures on the wall. I fairly normal life until we started uh, the investigations <laughs> until well, you started that path. <laughs> I just imagine the, I'm just thinking like the first thing I pictured when you said that you're sitting on the couch and your wife turns to you and she's like, you know, I think I'd like to get into that. And then it's like a, um, it's like uh, one of those sitcoms in the old days and you turn to her and like, baby, you're the greatest. But instead of like really happy and happy, like credits, you just get blood, like coming down the screen, <laughs> dripping down the screen, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just dripping down. <laughs> I wanted to ask, so when you were experiencing 
that entity or whatever in the woods. Just out of curiosity, maybe both of you guys can answer this for me. But like, when I think of evil spirits in the woods, I think of like traditional, very, very old school type of evil spirits that you hear about from like animalism cultures, like from thousands of years ago, right? So like, I think some of the oldest stories I heard are like, you know, sometimes evil spirits inhabit trees or like rocks or some like inanimate objects in the woods. But I never heard of like a Christian, Judeo-Christian demonic entity hanging out in the woods. So like, have you guys ever heard of them occupying the woods like that? And like, why would they occupy something so remote? It seems like wouldn't they go after or like hang around in more populated areas? I I don't think, okay. So Dave, I, I don't mean to speak for you, but I no, think for me, when I hear the term demonic, it's not exclusively Judeo Christian. You're talking about, for me, when I when I use the term demonic, when I hear the term demonic, you think of something outright evil. It's not necessarily a fallen angel or Lucifer, Satan, whatever you want to call them. It's more so something that has such an evil presence that it's beyond that of an angry spirit, if that makes any sense. Yeah, so it doesn't and, and necessarily the... have to be a fallen angel. Yeah, right. and yeah. you know, it's hard to say, right? I mean these things get labeled something different around the world, but it also doesn't mean they're not all the same thing, just following whatever culture that they're around. I have no idea. I, the only reason I I throw out demonic on it, and I'm not saying that's necessarily what it was, right? For a long time, I thought it maybe was like some Native American spirit. Right, you know, you're you're on my my land. Leave me the hell alone. Just go away. Uh, but after having experience with the demonic, it was that same intense feeling that I felt. So that's the only reason I I throw that out there. And you know, who knows? It could have been somebody lived back there a long time ago and conjured something up, or you know, I I don't know. But it was it was a brief. You know, we're talking one night. I'd go back and investigate it now, <laughs> but but back then we just went to a different campground. No, I, I don't blame you for going to a different campground. See, I go camping. I'm supposed to go camping in July. Now I'm going to be paranoid. <laughs> <laughs> are you going to Mendocino? No, okay. <laughs> we're heading... He's probably even good. Oh, where are we heading? Somewhere close to Altoona. So I think we should be okay. <laughs> so what got you into the paranormal? Was it? One of those things where you're like myself, JJ, Vic, and the other guys, where it's just, you know, the odd and the strange always attracted your attention. Yeah. Now, I didn't have a whole lot of experiences growing up, but growing up, I did read a ton of books. You know, I read books on uh, magic, conjuring, witchcraft, ghosts, UFOs. You know, I used to check out of the library, like that Time Life series that everybody talks about, you know, UFOs, Bigfoot, and so on. So if it was anything paranormal in the library, I was reading it. Uh, I read a ton growing up. So it's always been of interest to me. And, you know, I've read a ton of, of fantasy and sci-fi novels growing up, too. And so the idea of magic was always you know, top of mind was always interesting. So, you know, as we get into when Laura and I started the investigating and, you know, from watching the shows, the ability to capture something that you couldn't see, that was, that was exciting, right? That you got all kinds of cool tech equipment you can bring to the table and you get to sit in the dark and ask questions and, so I I had the I guess I was primed for it, not from experiences, but more from reading about it. You and your wife decided, hey, we're going to do this paranormal investigation type of stuff. What was the first location that you investigated, and did you find any evidence on that first investigation? Yeah, the first place was. Uh... Oh, I'm trying to think. I think it may have been called Berkeley. It was a uh, 
it was an old plantation. I think it was Berkeley Plantation in Virginia. And, you know, we didn't know much about anything at the time. We, I think we, we took this class and, you know, they taught us all kinds of stuff that I'm not entirely sure is real. Like, you know, the different color orbs, you know, blue means this, red means this, you know, most of it bunk, but it did talk about technique and the basics. And so I didn't have a lot of equipment yet. We had a recorder, an old Sony recorder that I still have, but I don't use because it won't connect to USB to my computer unless you've got Windows 95. Um, and I had a compass because I didn't have any fancy EMF meters yet. But, you know, they're like old school. You have a compass. You can you can see changes in the settings. And, you know, with a lot of camping, I had a compass. So we brought that. And we didn't have much happen that night except this one area outside. We weren't able to investigate inside the building because the plantation didn't allow that. We went to a presentation inside, and then we investigated the grounds. And we did have a moment where... I was able to get that compass needle to move where, uh, you know, it seemed like something was interacting at causing it to move a little bit. I mean, more than just like shaky movement. I mean, like significant enough movement to go, oh, that was something different. But it wasn't until a couple months later when we went on a, a ghost hunt to Hillview Manor which is in Newcastle, Pennsylvania. And the whole group went up there and we captured our first EVP. And that was cool, right? And when we heard that, we were absolutely hooked from that, that moment forward. What exactly did you hear in the EVP? What, what, what was it? Okay. And um, yeah. how'd you feel? Yeah, so in that one... There was, uh, I was running an old uh, Panasonic mini DV, or mini DV, it was one of the old small mini cassette cameras, right? Video cameras. And I didn't have, you know, infrared or anything like that. But there was this one hallway that we called the creepy hallway that just kind of blacked out after like 10 feet going into it. And I just pointed it down that, and I would just let it run until the tape ran out. And then we'd go off and investigate other areas. And then I'd come back and switch the tapes and, and all this. So I am I go out. We're getting ready to go up to the second floor to do a EVP session up there. And I'm checking on the camera, making sure it's it's working. And you hear me walk up to the camera. You can hear my footsteps. Right. I don't say hi to anybody. So there's nobody standing in this, you know, dark hallway that's almost completely black. I look at the screen, the thing's still running, and I walk away to meet up with the group that's, I don't know, fifteen yards away getting ready to go up the steps. And when I do that, you hear this it starts out with a female voice. And it goes, Diego, ah. like this really freaky breath sound after it. And then you hear a male's voice say something. Not sure what it is, but you can hear the consonants. You know, hear it, right, as, as it's going. The whole thing lasts about a minute long. And, you know, the last 20 seconds is when all this, this stuff happens. You hear it. There's nobody at the camera, but it's close to the camera that the audio happens. We're all going up the steps. You can hear us, kadoon, 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 going up steps. Nobody else walked up to the camera. So I know nobody was there. And it was definitely human voice. Now, we think that maybe there was some Native American uh, history on that property. So it might not be a name. It might be something in the, uh, you know, the uh, Lene Lenape language. Uh, but, but no, I haven't been able to find anything. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was cool because it was so 
definitely something paranormal. And to have captured it on like our second event, like I say, we were hooked. So it it got exciting after that. Man, that's chilling. I I really love that story. And you don't really hear, I I mean, I've heard EVP stories before, but it, to me, I guess I don't get uh, too enamored in, in um, that aspect of like ghost hunting and stuff. But when I hear a good one, like it's, it, you know, it's gives me uh, tingles, but I have to ask too, uh, what, what do you think being a professional of this, what is happening whenever you pick up an entity, like saying something or you, you hear, cause I know we, we all know by now there's res- residual hauntings, there's active hauntings, there's all kinds of stuff to talk about there. But like the thing I'm, I'm probably going to sound like a huge nerd about this, but I have to ask you, Dave, like, what do you think after all your experiences and, and studies and, and whatnot, what do you think is actually happening whenever there's a true case like this? Like how is the audio being created from a dismember or a uh, disembodied voice being picked up by an audio, if that makes sense. No, that's a great question. Uh, EVPs have kind of been my thing uh, throughout all the investigating. I like all the other equipment. It's fun. I've caught a few things on camera, you know, but listening to hours and hours of audio <laughs> is what I like to do. And what I think is happening is a magnetic imprint. So Vic and I did a a show on EVPs. We went through a whole bunch of them. And we pulled up Adobe Audition and started looking at the spectral image of these. And I have always, good EVPs generally do not sound like they're in the environment. So when you speak and you record somebody, you're hearing echoes of that voice off of what's in the environment, right? If they're in a uh, stone room, it's going to sound different than if they're a room full of curtains. There's a a dimensionality to the acoustics, to the voice as it's recorded. Most EVPs, in fact, this is what I listen for when I'm listening for EVPs, are flat. They don't sound like they're in the environment. They sound like they're just alone, like they've been recorded in, you know, with nothing around them. And when we looked at the spectral image of them, which this was what Vic did, what you don't see with most of the EVPs, the vast majority, is harmonics. So you see the bass you know, maybe one or two octaves that it's captured in, but all of those higher harmonics that the voices carry, it doesn't have it. So it's not an acoustic recording. I don't think you're recording sound waves. I think you're recording something magnetic. And, you know, it's it's not like there's... Uh, audio like that's you're right before the microphone somebody is releasing audio waves i don't think it's like that i think it's it's something else yeah i'm I'm totally with you on that i i agree i you know i mean we all know enough about science to know that sound waves carry through the atmosphere and there has to be a reverberation there has to be a source that starts that vibration um, and this is, like you said, this is flat. It's not harmonic. It's not something that is being echoed or carried through traditional means of, as we hear with our ears. And I think this is what I love about like what, what Chris and I do like podcasts, like every time we go to talk about a, a subject, either he or I, or both of us like come across something that day or recently that just adds so much Kindle to the discussion. And one thing I came across today, just doom scrolling through, um, Facebook for a little while. Uh, there was a, there was a video that someone posted of an audio recording from the movie Barbie. I think it was from Barbie or maybe it was a cartoon version of Barbie or something, but it was like, Ken was tied up and like Barbie, like just was destroying clothes. And like Ken, he, he's supposed to say, Oh, Barbie. But then the woman is asking the listener to say, what do you hear? Do you hear? Oh, fuck. Or do you hear? Oh, or do you hear Barbie? Oh, Barbie. And the crazy thing is it's like one of those, um, instances where, you know, people see the red, blue, or is it the, 
the yellow blue dress or the gold silver dress or something like that. Like people see both of them. If you watch a video like that and you hear that, and there's, I'm sure there's a million examples out there if you, if you search YouTube or something, but you can literally hear both words. If you read the word while you're hearing it, it sounded to me like one second she was saying, or he was saying, Oh fuck. And then the other second he was saying, Oh Barbie. And I couldn't believe that I was hearing clearly one or the other, and I was not hearing a mix of both. So I think that part of the discussion too in EVP is like how we interpret and hear sounds from an imprint that isn't like a traditional uh, vibration that's recorded. I don't know. Have you heard anything like that in your EVP studies? Like it's not just the imprint on the recording. It's how we are able to hear and interpret and understand what's being said in a different way, if that makes sense. Yeah. So interpretation is a huge part of it. I I can sit there and tell you this EVP says jack wagon, right? And what I've recorded is somebody saying happy town. Your mind is going to try to to play jack wagon in it over and over again. Every time you listen, you're like, and then you may actually hear it. Even if the syllables aren't right, even if the you know punctuation, the all of that, the the phonics aren't right. So when you are reviewing evidence, when you're reviewing audio to come up with EVPs, you really have to try to be objective as you're listening, because you're taking into account what was just said, the history of the place the history of the people that are with you, the people that live there, you're you're taking all of these factors into account in your mind as you're listening to that audio. And you imprint that impression over top of what you hear. Speech is weird, right? Unless speech is super crisp, clear, it's really hard to tell what's being said. That's why a lot of the EVPs that I get, I I can say what I think they mean. I can say what I think is being said. But a whole bunch of them, that may not be what's actually being said. What I do know is if I call it an EVP, it's got those characteristics. It's not the voice of somebody in the room. It has that flat sound. It is clearly speech. It is clearly some kind of words. but Man, it it is the mind is brilliant at trying to put together patterns, whether it's you know visual or audio. Pareidolia is is really really uh, a thing, and so yeah, you you may not hear what is actually happening, but at the same time, when you are in an investigation and you're trying to figure something out. And you're you're looking at the environment, the history, the people, and the words do sound like something that's relevant. You know, you you fact that into it in your investigation. You don't just throw it away because it sounds like it said, you know, little boy. And maybe it didn't say little boy, but if there's a little boy that died there, is a good possibility that's what it's saying and it's relevant. So continuing with the EVPs, Dave. Um, what are some of the creepiest ones or strangest ones you've encountered while, uh, you've come, not encountered, come across while doing your investigations? Well, some definitely stand out, um, for being interesting. I don't know about creepy. I don't have a whole, I, I have one that's creepy and freaky and that one actually happened I think two years ago at Lillian Place. It's a it's a really really old home down uh, near Daytona, Southern Ormond Beach, and they've opened it up uh, a couple times a year. They do public investigations on it, and we were recording. And, you know, I'll I'll record in each of the rooms that we go to. I'll stop the recorder or usually I keep one recorder running the entire time. And then 
I have another recorder that I just record in each room we're in, each sort of session. So one is just keeping track. So I can always go back and listen to who's, where, when, and see the whole storyline uh, versus just the clip that we're recording in a session. And because a lot of my trying to find stuff and figure it out is comparing notes between recorders. Like sometimes I'll get four or five different audio tracks. If I'm running two cameras, you know, and uh, three recorders over a night, it's like five times I got to listen to the investigation. But in this one, there were these grunts that sounded like a pig grunting. But it happened in three different rooms during that investigation. And it's loud. And it's, it's pretty clear. And it's a little freaky. So it, it, it apparently followed us wherever we were. That one, that one creeped me out. And, you know, there's nothing about that site that's like supposedly negative, bad stuff happening. It was just uh, an end throughout most of its, its time since it was built. That one was creepy, but I, I have uh, I have some good ones. I had at at Hillview Manor. I have one that said, "Hi, Dave." That was cool. So, you, as a paranormal investigator, you you sort of have your your checklist of of things you want to have happen in your life while you're paranormal investigating, and uh, you know, being touched, uh, seeing something on video, getting an EVP. Uh, but having your name called out on EVP is definitely one of the, the bucket list items that you want to have happen. Uh, and we've had, Laura's had her name called out too at uh, Monumental Church. And I have this one that's really cool from a, a Chesterfield County Jail, also in Virginia. And we were investigating that place. That was really cool. I don't know if they kept doing per, uh, public investigations there. We went in as the team. Uh, I used to be a part of Spirited History and uh, Spirited History Society. And what they do is paranormal investigations to raise money for the locations. So they have relationships with all the historical societies and the Historical Society of Virginia, they did. And anyway, if a new place was going to come on, we had a small team that would go in and investigate to see if there was activity there prior to doing a public investigation. And we were doing that and some cool stuff happened for one, the jail, the cells upstairs had like a metal box they were in. So it had these metal walls and then the bars and the metal walls had the, the bunk beds attached to them. And I was laying on the lower bunk and something went thong and really hit the uh, metal wall above the top bunk above me. So that was really cool. But while we were in that cell and some other people were outside the cell in the other room, I had this, this EVP that's, it's a female voice and it sounds really excited. And it goes, it's they are. And in it, almost like a British accent, he goes, I've got you now. I have no idea why anybody, you know, it wasn't in the voice of anybody on the team. And it was a relatively small team. It was like six of us. So it wasn't anybody on the team. It wasn't me. It was a female voice. And it was really cool. That was a, that was a good one. That, that one stands out. And we were in, let's see, I think I got guilty. In that place, that had a lot of activity. That place did. Another interesting one. We we had this place uh, called um, Bacon's Castle. It's uh, out in Smithfield, Virginia. And it, if you remember, I, mean, I don't know if they taught it about it in school. Bacon's Rebellion. But this was a guy who was involved in that, and it's a lot of activity around this place. But they have. It's this really cool old house, but then they've got the slave quarters out back. And we were sitting on the porch of the slave quarters doing an EVP session in the afternoon, right? This isn't at night. This is like six o'clock. It's light outside. And then somebody walks by just humming. 
just humming it. <laughs> like they were humming a tune. It wasn't any of us. We were asking questions. We were trying to get EVPs. And that was really cool. That was different. So we've, we've had a, I've had a, a bunch. I mean, I've got uh, another one. This was at the Arcadia, the old opera house. This is in Florida. We, <laughs> this one is different. Now, I, I can't attest to 100% that this is an EVP because this was a public investigation and they're harder to, you got so many people involved that there's a lot of noise. And this was outside. But they had just finished telling us the history of the opera house. We're standing on the steps going up into it. And they had told this story of this guy who came through this event. He came riding up. This is a historical thing. Came riding all the way up the steps on a horseback. Right? And I don't know if he was fighting somebody or delivering a message or what, but he... he came up the steps and see they had just finished telling this story and we're all walking upside inside and there sounds like a little girl who goes nay but nobody reacts to it right if somebody did that in a crowd you would hear people laughing like chuckling but that's all you hear is just this little girl who goes nay talking about you know after we had just finished talking about it that was funny that was different what I love about these stories and EVPs is uh, it's not just like th there's ri there's little room for um, explaining it away, in my opinion, more so than like, because if you have a single person, right, and they're by themselves or whatever, they're not, they're, they're not trying to record. They have, they claim to have a haunting or an experience. Like we were just talking to someone the other day who had like a UFO experience and, and they were by themselves or it was like a secondhand story or something like that. I was like, okay, okay. You like can't really but then you this is these are stories where you have actual uh physical evidence <laughs> and multiple yeah. people can hear them and interpret them and then i i do find that really exciting and fascinating as you were telling these stories i was going along trying to quickly uh search for these locations and um they're actually really cool they look like they're rich in history and my favorite one so far is looking at pictures of bacon's castle like you were saying in um uh virginia and I see the slave quarters and I was just imagining, you know, you guys were sitting outside on that tiny porch and you just hear that person whistling, walking by, but you, you look at it and it's very clear that these places that have a lot of rich history, they're actually really well maintained. So it, it makes sense that like, why wouldn't there be some kind of, if there is such, you know, if there's a thing that's going on at that location, why wouldn't there be uh, a residual thing uh, happening that, that pick, picks up on these EVPs and whatnot? And my question on EVPs is specifically geared towards your opinion, Dave, on a specific TV show that was very popular, still is popular, with uh, a specific individual <laughs> named Zach Bagans mm -hmm. and the EVPs that they seem to collect in their investigations. Some of them are downright creepy, but given that you literally like look for them and you listen for them and they're like, you actually apply a science to it. You and Vic both do that. What are your opinions on some of these EVPs that appear on these quote unquote ghost hunting shows? Well, one of the frustrations I have with these shows is a lot of times they'll give an EVP and it's just not clear, right? They're, it's, it's mumbling, it's raspy, you can't hear distinct words, you can't tell what it's saying. And, and they all go, it said death, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, I didn't hear anything. I, I you know. Like I, I just some... heard a gurgle. Like, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's frustrating. And I, and I think that that may have something to do with the audio process and the way they're putting the show together. You would think that they would make the audio clearer uh, doing it that, but I don't know. You know, ghost hunters used to capture the, you know, an EVP here, an EVP there, and it was fairly believable, right? They're, they weren't long EVPs. A lot of EVPs are really short. You know, it's one or two words, you know, a couple of syllables. 
Ghost Adventures, you know, they've captured some stuff that is pretty long. I don't know. I, you know, and I don't know what to make of it. You know, there's always rumors about creating and fabricating evidence to keep the show exciting. I don't know how much of that they do versus real, actual evidence that's been captured. You know, I listen. I enjoy. I actually, I had. I don't even watch those shows much anymore. I think the last one I watched that was interesting was Paranormal Lockdown, uh, with Nick Nick Groff and uh, yeah, and Katrina. But I haven't watched much of anything lately. The one thing that <laughs> kind of threw me off is when they first started, they went to Paveglia in Italy, kind of like the place where. Well, if you were sick and you had a plague, it was kind of a place where they the town threw you into. Yeah, that was a plague mask episode, right? They had the yeah, that was mask. a plague mask yeah. episode, and they're like asking the questions in English, and they're in Italy, and all the spirits would have that were probably there would have been peasants that probably would not have spoken a lick of English, and yeah, <laughs> now that's interesting. That, that's there's an interesting question there, which is if you are in a location where whatever spirits would be there are not English speaking, would you get responses? And would they understand you? Would they understand what you're even saying? Right. And my guess is you would still get answers, and they would be in English. Just like if somebody who spoke Spanish and all they spoke was Spanish and they came up and they toured Eastern State Penn or, you know, Trans Allegheny or one of these other big sites, they might get answers in Spanish. Uh, I, I think that has to do with the process. I think that it has to do with what they actually are. Now, what that is, I don't know. Uh, Dean, you mentioned a couple of times residual versus intelligence uh, hauntings and activity. I'm not entirely sure there's anything that is residual activity. I, I, I think there is activity that may ignore you, that may just happen. But in my mind, I have, and we had a long conversation on this Discord a long time ago. Uh, I do not see how residual could happen. So they talk about the stone tape theory. They talk about limestone capturing energy patterns and so on. Okay. Well, what's the mechanism to replay those patterns? There's there, there's no mechanism to either record or to capture or replay in any cohesive manner that I see. Now, the, probably the most interesting proposal I've heard on that is is that, you know, maybe a benevolent species, an alien species or something like that has come down and placed recorders in different places to monitor humans and release some of this information. A aside from that, I, I don't know what the mechanism would be. It doesn't make any sense to me. Now, I've heard plenty of stories. And I think we might, might have captured some stuff here or there that might have been residual footsteps, things like that. But I have a hard time thinking it's residual. I think it's it's more likely somebody playing out a scenario after death, and the whoever's around them is irrelevant to them. They're they're going through the motions, perhaps, but I don't think it's like this captured and then released thing i think there is if there's if there's activity i think there's something there generating it does that make sense yeah it, it definitely does if you guys don't mind i would like to transition to something we were talking about before we started the recording dave you mentioned when you were doing some of your investigations you encountered you've had some creepy like or odd encounters and oh, yeah. would you mind going into that and would you mind also sharing about the potential attachment that you guys ended up with yeah so so we've had some 
some pretty intense stuff happen. Um, I had, so I've been touched. That's, that's always, you know, again, that bucket list. Uh, we had one weekend and this is at Hillview Manor, that a whole bunch of stuff happened. I don't know. I think we were there for like four days. We were down in the basement at the end of that creepy hallway where I had that camera where we captured that first DVP. It goes down into a boiler room and there's a room off of that. And we had found all these patient records and in that room and taken them back to the office of the folks managing the place. Uh, Candy and uh, she was the one running at the time. And Laura was sitting out on the floor of the office with these records and just flipping through records, you know, looking through stuff. And Candy and Jason were on the other side of the room working on the website or something. And I'm sitting near the door reviewing audio. Well, that was the room where I got the Hi Dave EVP. And I was in the middle of listening to that recording and I got tapped on my side. And it was hard enough and distinct enough that I turned around because I thought Laura had reached over and tapped me and wanted me to look at something. And I said, yeah, what? And she was like 10 feet away. So there's nobody near me. And it was a, a clear tap on my side. And so that was interesting. Did you know when that tap happened? Did you know uh, in that moment, you, you, or did you think in that moment it was... When you turned around and you saw there was no one there, did you like, were you like, oh my God, this is, or did, was it one of those things where you're like, oh, huh, yeah. and then you thought back on it? And, okay. So you were oh, like no, in the moment. No, it was, <laughs> it was hard enough in the moment. I knew somebody tapped me. And so I'm like, you're not going to believe this. <laughs> so, so yeah, that was, that was uh, exciting. That was pretty cool. Now I've had that in that same building down the, the hallway, the, the modern hallway, you know, I think it was one North. Uh, they give the, the floors names, but it's been so long. My memory's terrible, but it was the modern wing that they built on that. And we were going down that hallway. And what had happened is Laura had seen a, the night before, I think Laura had seen a, a red light float down that hallway and go into a room. And then heard a heart monitor beeping in the room. And I think she was ahead of us. I didn't see or hear it. And so we were investigating it again the next night. And I think Candy saw a red light go down somewhere down the hall. So we're all, there's a, a whole bunch of us sort of standing there at, the, at a, a junction in that hallway, like a crossroads. And we're looking down and everything's dark. And I got really dizzy all of a sudden, really, really lightheaded. And it happened so fast that I had to go down to my knees because I was afraid I was going to fall. And I looked down beside me and someone with us was already laying on the floor because the same thing had happened to her like seconds before it happened to me. And that was really intense. If it had just been me, I'd be like, well, okay, I've been tired. I haven't got enough sleep, whatever. I got lightheaded. But it happened to us both at the exact same time. And both of us had to lay down on the floor to to sort of recover from it. And so that was that was intense. Now, the weekend that the thing with the records, the tap and the EVP happened was right before Ghost Hunters filmed their episode on that property. And when Ghost Hunters filmed their episode, there were two major things that happened that they captured. Well, they captured, they saw, you don't see it on, in camera. One was they thought they saw a black shadow being in a stairwell behind the doors that went to the stairwell. And the other thing was they had a flashlight session where flashlights went off in some order. Well, we had had the flashlight activity a bunch of times in there. But the weekend before when we were there, Laura 
and I think Candy both saw that black shadow in that same hallway before they captured it. And we thought somebody, we thought it was the reflection of somebody. We thought somebody was in the building. And all of the the group that had investigated that night had left. And it was just four of us in the building and everything was locked up. And so we literally went through every room, cleared the building to make sure there was nobody there. Because we thought there somebody was. And it took so long that we decided, because we were supposed to get some sleep and then leave the next day. Well, it was already the next day. So after we finished that, we just got in the car and started coming home, which was like a seven-hour drive, eight-hour drive. And it took us 19 hours because we kept having to stop and sleep. Well, we were exhausted still when we got home. And I remember, Laura, we had stopped at Wendy's and gotten dinner. And Laura had gotten one of those salads. And so we ate in bed and then went to sleep. Well, she left that salad container on her nightstand. And in the middle of the night, something was flicking that stupid salad container. Pop, pop, pop. It woke me up. I'm like, what the heck? Wasn't her. Went back to sleep. The next night, same thing. Something's popping on on the nightstand. And we're exhausted. I mean, it was like we could not recover from this trip. And the third night, I fell out of bed. Now, I haven't fallen out of bed since I was like five years old, okay? It's a big bed, plenty of room for both of us. I fell out of bed. And it woke Laura up, and she looked up, and she saw me standing over top of her, raising my fist like I was going to hit her. And she screamed. And then I stood up. And I'm like, what? And she's like, all of a sudden, really confused, because I was standing over top of her, ready to hit her, but now I'm standing up. So obviously, that wasn't me. And really, really freaked her out. Of course, it freaked me out because I don't fall out of bed. It took about four days to figure out what happened. And I, you know, again, we were just so tired. We were just drained. And that was that something followed us home. And I was at work and I was at the end of the fourth day and I'm exhausted. I'm, I'm about half asleep and I'm like... It hits me. I'm like, daggone it. Something followed us home and is just tapping us, right? We're just drain, draining us. And there's an exercise that you do, uh, you can do uh, for protection with, with these things of just creating a bubble of light around you. You know, I sort of picture it as a bubble that starts at my sternum and just sort of pushes out and gets bigger and bigger and, and, and forms around me. And that's usually, you know, we would do that before going into a location. And so I sat in the chair and I did that. And then it was like I woke up from, you know, being asleep for four days. I was wide awake, bright eyed, bushy tailed, and it was gone. And nothing happened after that. But it was like within, you know, 30 seconds, I went from, totally walking through water, you know, to everything was fine. So yeah, you know, we've, now we've had stuff follow us home before from investigations and usually it'll be like, uh, it'll make some noise, tap on walls. Um, we, we had this one time where somebody must've had a birthday party, but there was like a, a thing of balloons and it just kept pushing them around the room. <laughs> it freaked the dog the heck out. Uh, but we uh, usually, you just ignore it. And within a couple of days, it gets bored and it goes back to wherever it came from. But this time around, it was actually you know draining my energy. Now, the story is, is that there was a, uh, a maintenance worker that worked in the building 
And his workbench would have been the room above the one where we found the records, like up the hall a little bit, up some steps. And the and he died in the building. And he did not like women. And so that's, you know, sort of what we piece together, think that it was him that followed, because that's where we were recording, where we got the EVP. He liked me, didn't like her. I don't know. Hard to say. This is the, there's two reasons I find stories like this. So it's just crazy to me because, well, two, okay. So my two questions to you are how <laughs> in your craziest dream, your wildest imagination, um, how do entities like follow people? Because I just like, I'm trying, I'm picturing like, do they just get in the car with you? <laughs> Cause they can't travel as fast as you <laughs> if they're on foot, you know, like all they just fly. Like, I'm just really fascinated by that, those dyna- dynamics of the stories. And the, the other, the other part is like, as, as people of religion, um, what's happening? Like, are, like, are these beings like who, who, you know, they could be people, you know, assuming like you just said that it's the, the guy who killed him or died in the building, um, the maintenance worker, um, why are they just hanging around? Like, if, if, like, so they're, they're there. It seems like in this case, like you're saying they're cognizant, they don't like you. They're making informed, intelligent decisions to do something like follow you. So it's like how, like when you go to, go to the other side, like why and how are they just hanging around and are they always aware? Is it like in the same vein as like, we're alive now, we're always aware as long as we're awake, or is it kind of like, you know, they come in and out of consciousness in some other realm? Um, I don't know. I, I always have to ask that question to someone who has experience like, to, like you, because there has to be some kind of best answer or like wildest imagination, a, imagination answer uh, to those questions. And th- those are the questions that always fascinate me the most. Yeah. And those are both great questions. I, I let me, let me handle the, how do they follow you first? You know, I have no idea, but I don't think that they are bound by the physical world the way that we are. Uh, so are they literally floating beside you out the car? No idea. You know, what I know is, is that they can follow you because it's happened. And and just about any paranormal investigator who's done this long enough will tell you, yes, they can follow you. You have to be extremely clear when you leave a place, do not follow me. And that tends to work, but it still happens. Um, once they've followed you, how do they get back? Right? Are they, is it a long walk back <laughs> to the side of the road? You know, they hitchhike and thumb in it. I, I have no idea. Uh, and and nobody knows. Um, I I'm I have a feeling that it has to do more with uh, they're not bound to time and space the way we are, or at least space. Uh, I don't know about time, but it's it's hard to say. As far as what's happening from a religious standpoint, a faith standpoint, uh, I also have no idea, but I have different thoughts. Um, you know, the, the Bible, and I'm Christian, uh, I, sort of a Catholic-leaning Protestant. I'm not all the way Catholic for, for several reasons, which we get into on various podcasts, but... Uh, We're going to get you. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, so there's, there's a couple ideas. First, from a Catholic standpoint, there's the idea of purgatory, where you go to work stuff out. This may be part of that process. Uh, it may just be a spirit, somebody who's past working out stuff. And maybe God wants them to work that out by reliving some things they went through. Maybe that's where that you know residual kind of thing happens. You know, maybe it's through interacting. I, I, I don't know. But, but that's one possibility. The other possibility is, is that they're just not ready yet, and God has something more for them to learn. It's not an official purgatory thing, but, you know, from a Protestant standpoint, Protestants are are not very open on this, right? They're sort of like, you die, you're you're going one way or another. 
uh, that moment. And of course, it depends on which variation of Protestant you are in those beliefs. You know, my my dad had an interesting idea. He his concern, and he wasn't super thrilled about me investigating, but his concern was that these were these were the folks that were condemned. That you know the the spirits we're interacting with are that's those people that uh, they're they're not going to make it, and so this is just either part of their punishment or. Uh, they're just waiting around for their punishment and interacting where they can. But I, I don't know. But I know it happens. And, and I do know that the Bible accounts for the possibility of ghosts. You know, there's, there's a lot of, well, there's no ghosts in the Bible. There is. There are passages, and I don't remember them offhand. We've had this discussion on Discord, too. Ghost uh, of Samuel. Of yeah. Supposed oh, that, yeah, that's, of, yep. yep. That's one example. Uh, and so if you, there's talking to the dead and necromancy, and which I don't know if I equate those to be the same thing, but there's a bunch of stuff in the Bible that supports a life after death that is not just rainbows, unicorns, golden harps, and so on. Dave, um, I got, I have a quick question for you. Um, so my parents are from a Caribbean background, like ancestrally, like my mom Spaniard and my dad Indian, mm -hmm. but in the Caribbean, they have a superstition in which when you go to, and it's commonly uh, placed with funerals, when you go to a funeral home, you go to a funeral, you go view a body, you go to the cemetery. Before you enter your home, you're supposed to turn around and step through your doorway backward. Mm, yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, you've heard that before? I have heard that before. Yeah. So I've not like tried that. it, but I've yeah. heard <laughs> it. It's so funny. It's something that I still do to this day. Anytime my wife and I, we like go to a funeral or something, I'm like, wait, wait. We got to turn around and then we got to walk him backward. Interesting. Yeah. Now, have it, you ever had anything at the house? Um, I know you did when you were younger, you had stuff, but now. You... Mm, I can't say that I felt anything in here. Um, my sister, interestingly enough, I think this was last summer. Um, she came to pet sit for us because we have three cats and we have two dogs. And, of course, the dogs need more attention than the cats do. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> so she said that she was in this room right here <laughs> that I'm recording in. She had the gate set up. We had a fairly new rescue dog that we just celebrated a year with him. And he was laying on his bed on the ground here. And my other dog was in bed with her. So she said she's watching whatever on her tablet. And she said she heard my voice call my dog his name mm -hmm. my voice distinctly she said she heard odie and my dog jumped down and he started whining at the gate and she said that she was so freaked out and my sister is more sensitive than i am i i i've noticed that um Women in general tend to be more sensitive to seeing mm -hmm. and hearing these things for what reason, I don't know, might be more intuitive or more open to their feelings on certain things. Because, you know, us men, like you said, it's like, okay, I hear something tapping on the wall. I don't have time for this shit, so I'm just <laughs> going to ignore it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Type of thing. Yeah, But yeah, so like me personally, nothing in this house, but her she was like she heard that instance and then she had another instance of sleep paralysis where she saw like a floating like figure of someone like coming mm -hmm. towards her and my cats like kind of like snuggled and surrounded her <laughs> to protect her which was really interesting yeah see yeah, the she... investigative in me wants to diagnose that so does she ever have that stuff at home <laughs> no no well, that's interesting no okay yeah, she said that's never happened at home. Um, 
The weirdest thing she said that happened in the Florida home was her door was completely shut. It was around 1 a.m. Um, it was like pushed in all the way, like you hear the click. It wasn't locked. Her door opened by itself, handle and all. <laughs> hmm. And she thought it was my like my dad or my mom or something. Open the door opens all the way. Nobody there. And my parents' master bedroom is on the first floor. She's up on the second floor. So she got up real quick and she shut the door and laid in bed and she got under her blankets. And then she said like a little later, she felt someone go in her ear. Yeah. I'm like, it's too late then that they've already come in through the door. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's when you leave the room and shut the door. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it is interesting. Um, when you start talking about physically moving things, doors, you know, items in a room, whatever, it, it takes a lot of, you have to think from an energy standpoint, without physicality, without a physical body, it's got to happen somehow. And so it's something pretty strong if it's doing that. Right now, from a, a sleep paralysis and uh, mimicry standpoint, that's never really a good sign either. Yeah, <laughs> which then perfectly segues into one of the topics that you mentioned earlier that you wanted to talk about, which was demons or the demonic. Yeah, in, in the general. demonic. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's the focus of the podcast I have coming out. Um, I had an experience back in 2014. Well, it started in 2014. I took a a buddy hunting who uh, was having some problems with something demonic. And it latched on to me, and it hung on for about three and a half years of of pretty not fun direct attacks. I'm sorry, a year and a half of, of not fun stuff. And then after that, it was probably about three years of stuff messing in my life. It was a pretty wild experience. And when I look back at it, you know, I think it had purpose. Uh, my faith was very different then than it is now. So I, it, it, when you, you think of the worst of it, the attacks, I... After that camping trip, there was a pretty intense experience during the camping trip that sort of kicked it all off. But but after it, when I came home, about three weeks later is when it really started. I uh, I woke up and there was this this black entity, you know, seven eight feet tall, standing at the foot of the bed, trying to rip my soul out of my body. Right, I, I could feel it tugging like i could feel it pulling trying to get me out of my body and i was in sleep paralysis i was frozen when i woke up and this was happening were you by yourself or was your wife there? no my wife was right beside me now mm -hmm. these things are tricky right so sleep paralysis is a thing and it can be accompanied by nightmares um, one of the key things is, is that whenever these things happened, that happened three times, by the way, uh, three different times over two months that it was trying to rip me out of my body in three different directions. At first, I finally was able to yell and it stopped. And then after that, I'm like, okay, well, if there's something evil, then there's got to be something good. So I, that's when I started, you know, researching, got a translation of the Bible I felt was easy to read, and started reading the Bible and started focusing on my faith. But in any of the experiences I had, I never woke up again. So it's not like I was asleep. So I woke up, I had sleep paralysis, and experience happened. 
and then I'm awake. It wasn't like a nightmare I'd woke up from after that, or even went back to sleep. I'd be awake for hours. Uh, And then this thing started, after that first night, started showing up in my room. Uh, And it would stay in our bedroom in the corner and watch and just see the hatred towards me from where it was. And it was... It was a figure, but it wasn't defined. It was a black mass. It had the shape of a being with like bipedal being that was seven, eight feet tall, uh, darker than what was around it. You know, in, in the corner it would stand was right by the door, and there's always light coming in the door from the hallway. Uh, and, you know, you could see it. It was well defined. Now, my wife could never see it. She could sense that there was something off. She could sense something was there sometimes, but that's it. She never saw anything. She never had any experience directly to her. I actually had it wake me up one night screaming in my ear, and I couldn't hear out of my ear for almost an entire day. It was like a a train whistle right in my ear. It was that loud. One night, I woke up, and it was trying to shove a golden orb down my throat, and I pushed it off with my hands, and it was like reaching into, I don't know, gel. Like, I was able to put my hand into it and push, and it was staticky feeling. My arm was numb for the next day and hurt. It ached where I pushed that that arm through it to get it off of me. So, I mean... These experiences had physical effects that were beyond just, ooh, I had a bad nightmare last night. And then they would always happen after 3 o'clock in the morning, between 3 and 4. And it would show up at around 3 and hang out in the room if I was awake. And it would be there for 2, 3 hours, and then it would just fade away. So I attribute it to that and not sleep paralysis because. There were plenty of times that it was there where there was no dream. There was no sleep paralysis event. Now, maybe somebody slipped some ayahuasca in my tea or something. I don't know. But uh, it seemed pretty real to me. I want to go back to what you said earlier. You said that your friend was experiencing this type of stuff with this demonic attachment. Do you not, I'm not trying to accuse your friend of anything. Do you think that your friend kind of found you as an outlet to get rid of it? Oh no, it stuck with him. This, so it it still did. Oh yeah. 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 I have a theory around this stuff. Uh, We talked a little about it a little bit on the rundown episode or two back. I think that the demonic is like a virus. Okay. I think that in our lives, we have doors that we open, play on a Ouija board, commit some egregious sin, right? Why is it that right after you commit some sin, you don't have a demonic attack? You know, you would think that if it's related to that, you would have that. I think what happens, I I look at it as like the spiritual immune system. Each of those things you do is weakening your immune system. And if it's weak enough, when you come in contact with somebody who's going through oppression or possession, it's like catching a virus. It's like, oh, here's somebody that I can latch on to. And because your your immune system is weak, it can. You know, if your immune system is strong, you've, you know, got a good relationship with God, you're, you know, strong in your faith and so on, it might just bounce off. It's it's you can come in contact with somebody and it's not going to have any impact on you. Uh we we, we talk, sort of 
strengthen that idea was a conversation with Father Birdsong where we were talking about he walked into a spiritual shop, a uh, spiritist shop down in New Orleans, you know, 30 some years ago, and he got a massive headache. And I'm like, that was like your immune system. You were in seminary. Your immune system was strong. It warned you there's something bad here. But it didn't affect you long term because you had a strong immune system. But if you had gone into that shop and you had a whole bunch of doors open from, you know, a bunch of sin or a bunch of activities dealing with uh, the occult, then yeah, maybe you don't even notice it. You don't get the headache. Maybe you come away with something following you home. So that's that's kind of the way I view it. But no, I don't think I uh, I don't think he uh, and he wouldn't have uh, intentionally. In fact, the <laughs> the night in the camper was when he finally told me the details of what was going on in in his life, right? Because it was tearing his life up. Uh, relationships, chaos, health, everything. It, it was, they love that. They want to create chaos, pain, and suffering. And he was going through it, and he wouldn't talk to me about it. And he's like, look, I don't want you to have any problems. And sure enough, <laughs> I should have listened. I'm like, no, you know, just tell me. Let's talk about it. And he talked to me in detail at, that night at the camper about what was going on. And then stuff started that night. It was crazy. Yeah, I I truly believe that when you talk about certain things, you you kind of have a little bit of chink in the armor for for whatever it is to to come in. And like JJ always says, and like Father Birdsong always says, when you talk about this stuff, you open yourself up as a target. And oh, like, you absolutely do. Yeah, and I like what Father Birdsong says. He's like the enemy doesn't like when you talk about it it really doesn't especially in any constructive way right right i know dean's like ah, that stuff's not gonna bother me <laughs> but you know just because you don't believe in the devil dean doesn't mean he doesn't believe in you oh come on man that classic <laughs> line you really gonna throw that at me i am i am you gotta uh, you seriously gotta watch Here's the thing. I, I, I never, ever, I'm going to pretend I'm not an atheist, by the way. Uh, I, I'm never in my life going to pretend like this stuff can't possibly exist. Uh, my problem is that there's just so much from so many different aspects of the world, um, in so many religions and so many different cultures that have come and gone and in future cultures and religions that will soon come, uh, you know, a hundred years from now, 200, if however long humanity is around. And if you believe in evolution, uh, uh, humanity, if it's still around in a million years, isn't going to be humanity anymore. It's going to be, it's going to be shlumanity. It's going to be some other completely different form that we're not going to understand. So like, that's the, that's the burden that I carry listening to all this is like, my mind is immediately uh, like, I, I'm never going to shoot down people for what they, their experiences or what they say. Um, I, in fact, I think that there's a lot of good evidence to suggest that there is something going on for sure. Uh, but like you said, Dave, like you, you, you don't know, all you can do is speculate. Um, so that, I think that's why I personally find this stuff fascinating. And the reason why we have this podcast in general, like the reason I keep coming back, I really love talking about this stuff in general, because I do think there's something and just the sheer fact that we're sitting here talking <laughs> is like, that's enough to blow my mind every single day that we're conscious, that we have other consciousnesses or, or consciousness around us that have different experiences. And by the way, I want to, I have to say something really, uh, this is kind of joking, half joking, but maybe also half serious. I think that whatever's going on with the, uh, the entities and the demonic and all that stuff, I think it's probably just as likely that there's some, um, race of higher intelligent being like alien or something who is just like having, like, they're just fucking with us. It's their version of like teenagers <laughs> throwing Tic Tacs at our windows and like, toilet tping wow. houses it's like hey what you remember those humans we let's go fuck with those humans we'll, we'll pretend to be that old guy who used to occupy that house and we'll like flick their you know we'll scare the shit out of them it'll be fun man come on and they hop into our three-dimensional realm they fuck with us and then they go back and they just like leave us scarred in the same way that kids like hold a magnifying glass up to an ant 
it's like there's not really some giant entity with some laser power beam shooting down at the end. It's just some kid who has a higher level of awareness and, and technology than that ant does. Um, <laughs> I, that would suck though, right? Like if we were we were that low on the rung of existence, which it seems like we are, right? Because we have all of this stuff happening to us that is very much real, whether it's, you know, whether it's psychologically born or whether it's actually coming out from an, an external force and having a direct impact on us. It seems like we often get the short end of the stick in a lot of ways. So like the, like it does, this stuff does bother me psychologically sometimes, but like, like you said, Dave, like the only hope we have sometimes is to just picture that big light ball just growing outward. And that like, there's positivity. There has to be good. There is good in the world. Let me, I have to kind of ruminate on that for a bit, or I'm going to like really have some issues. And maybe that does flip back to the idea that, you know, like, like you said, talking about this stuff, whether demonic actually is true or not, it does seem to welcome something at least psychologically heavy in the same way that when you go into battle or something like, you know, you hear stories from the Bible, like they went into battle and then they had to like go sit in a campfire for a week to like really what they were doing was like cleansing their mind, but it was supposed to be a ritual. And I think that there's something to that idea that you really have to take a step back once in a while, or you're going to get so sucked into it that you're going to invite something that screws up your life. Dean, um, if I, if I may yeah. address your, for, from a historical perspective about religion constantly changing, if you look at certain faiths, for the past two, three thousand years. Hinduism, for an example, has not changed for the past five thousand years. It's one of the oldest religions on the planet. Still the same practices and beliefs that they've done on the subcontinent for the past five thousand years. When you talk about Judaism, yeah, there are sects of Judaism in which people are more radical in their interpretation, but the text itself has remained. When you talk about Christianity, the text itself has remained. Now you have the interjection of, I'll start with Constantine the Great, one of the best Roman emperors, with the Council of Nicaea, picking and choosing what gets entered into the New Testament. And that's where you have the human influence. But even with the old quote-unquote pagan religions, with the Greek gods, and the Roman gods, and the Gallic be- gods, and your Celto-Iberians. It was more so that when the Romans went to a specific location, they're like, oh, you have a thunder god? We have a thunder god too. I like your thunder god. You like our thunder god? I'm going to incorporate your thunder god. It's the same person, but it's just a different name. So if you look at the past like 3,000 years of human history, Religion really doesn't change that much for the layman. When you get to the radical folks, like you like to give the example of certain people that think that they are the only ones going to heaven and everyone else is just a bag of meat for them to exterminate. Yeah, you have those folks. But I think in the next thousand years, unless we completely drop it, for some sort of technological reason or we encounter alien beings that are like yeah we figured out a way to to die and come back and then there's nothing so there's like no point it to me it's not going to change because we already have a sample size of the past 2000 years 3000 years 5000 years even with china with taoism buddhism you have all these different examples. Yeah, you have sex branching off, but the the core of it is still technically the same. So it's not you, like how would, gonna, re- how would I what what how how would you respond to the idea that there are so many religions that have actually died out or nearly completely petered out? Because you're talking about a sample size that is still around, and that's that makes sense within the bubble. But if you're talking about the evolution of religion spanning out, like your your example of the Thunder God, um, it's I don't think it's so much like multiple people sprung up the idea of a Thunder God in different locations. I think it was a branching out that took traditions that moved along with people 
uh, out of a centralized area. And that's kind of in the same way of evolution. Like we all spanned out from one area of the world and kind of moved outward in a migratory fashion. Yeah, that was Um, with my reference with the Roman military moving around, not just from a military perspective, but they're in. And one of my old classics professors who's passed on for like a decade now, um, Dr. Clack in at Duquesne, where we went, he brought up the example of there's the, the Roman God Jupiter. And in Sanskrit, there was a God of thunder called Jupiter. So the correlation is there. The expansion is there. What I'm trying to get at is when you talk about the core beliefs of certain religions, it's not going to morph into this Christianity and like the satanic church or temple are going to fuse together into one super religion in which the same way that Krampus and Santa Claus kind of fused into in the modern day perspective of how Krampus is kind of like his ally to discipline um bad children and i feel like i'm talking too much dave feel free to uh interject in your opinion at any point well so first i want to say that dean you and i are not that far apart in where i was and we'll say 2013 You have an experience like this, and you reevaluate big time. So, I mean, that is, but I, I would have said to you back then, you know, and and when I was younger, yeah, I think there's a God. I think there's a maker. I think there's something beyond us. No clue what it is. And I was not a big fan of religion as a whole. Because I think it's a bunch of people controlling other people, and it's just frustrating. I, I grew up in uh, in Protestant churches, and I saw a bunch of people that were, uh, and not all, but I saw enough examples of hypocrisy that it was frustrating and turned me off on organized religion. And I tried to read the Bible when I was younger, and I just couldn't get through it. It was just, you know begat this, begat that, and these and thys and thous, and I just never could could understand it. And that's why I was an atheist for a while, too. Yeah. 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 I mean, I never reached the point of atheist, right? I, I, I always felt that there was something there, but, you know, not sure, sure what. And what I knew when this happened was that there is evil, right? Because this was not just some, and and if it is some alien, like like in Under the Dome or whatever that's squashing us like ants, they're an asshole. <laughs> I don't have anything to do with it. Um, but I don't think that's the case. You, you know, this is, it could be, it's possible. But, when I read the Bible after that, and I, it took me a year and a half or so to get through it, but I read it end to end, except for some of Psalms. I kind of got bored. But it made sense to me. There was a, a different perspective. And now, in, in my case, I would say that uh, that was the Holy Spirit working in me. That was God working in me. My experience uh, in that trailer that night, that camper, ended with me saying that I renounce Satan. That isn't something that would come out of me. That was, I, first of all, I don't say thee. <laughs> you know, I don't renounce thee. I would say, yeah, I renounce you, right? It was, it was this weird experience that ended when I said that. And it was a, a I believe, a, God working in me. And you will hear that when you convert, things start making sense. 
you know, the Bible starts making sense. You, you know, you go through the process and you just read it like a book and it has no meaning. When you read it as a believer, it has, it has great meaning in it. And I looked at the world differently and I look at the world differently now because of it. And that's not just me uh, making that change. So I don't know. I, I think your idea of religions, religions morphing over time is interesting. We talked about it on the rundown, I believe. You were, cause I think the end you were like, Hey, maybe, you know, a thousand years from now, 10,000 years from now, Satan's a good guy, right? Uh, he's done some work to help society, uh, versus just being this, you know, bad guy who's, you know, the, the owner of hell. I, I don't know if you get there. I think that what happens in my view is, is that we're like children and God treats us like children and we learn and are exposed to what we can be, uh, what we can understand in time. And that as we are able to handle and understand more, there's more revelation. Now, will that ever happen again with Christianity? Will there be another book of the Bible? Will there be anything new? I don't know. But that's, you know, only God knows that. Yeah, those are great points. And um, just to add a little bit more flavor for the conversation, from my perspective, I think one of the greatest things that I really reflected on that that came to, for me, turning the turning point, um, I wouldn't say turning away from Christianity, but just stepping outside and trying to occupy a bigger sphere of the world to include Christianity uh, was the progression. And I, I can hear JJ already taking a sigh. Um, but I really do believe, regardless of whatever you want to argue in terms of history and, and historical evolution, in and, and I'm sorry, this is going to get so uh, nerdy, religious heavy. We can cut this out because it's conversation. Um, if it's too much no, religiosity, okay, it's cool. Not too much for me. It's a, no. up yeah. to you guys, but I'm good. Yeah. So um, the Old Testament, right? So I, I think about it from the perspective of, of a one true God, Judeo Christian God. Put aside the idea that in Judeo Christianity you have Islam, which is a whole different set of, um, not completely different set of rules and functions, but there are a lot of differences um, underneath that similarity of of a uh, a singular um, God, omnipotent, omnipresent, all that stuff. So just focus on Judeo Christianity. When you go back to Judaism, you had the Old Covenant, right? So the Old Covenant were the laws, the ways that people were supposed to comport their life. And that's what people subscribe to for so long before, you know, modern Christianity or the idea of Christianity with Jesus coming onto the scene and stuff. And then the argument that I hear, uh, or, or the reasoning of the switch is that God created a new covenant. So the thing that I get hung up on sometimes with this is, well, God is omnipresent. God is all knowing all, all that stuff. So must have a plan. There must be a plan to lay it all out, and it's a, it's a progressive plan. God didn't just suddenly snap and say, snap his finger and say, you know what? I think I'm going to create a new a new sect of or you know a new branch of religion that I'm going to send my son down and go through the the 30, 30, 33 years or whatever, and then um and have this new religion create a new covenant. That plan must have already existed to begin with, right? So also put aside the fact that everybody in Jude, uh, Judaism who came before Jesus you know, all the deaths and all the other religions and stuff, there had to have been some kind of like get out of free car, jail free card, or maybe not. Um, but if God is truly all love and all that stuff, then, you know, he wouldn't just let them expire or go without having to experience, you know, the, the new evolution to a new religion. So the thing that I think about, you know, the evolution from the Old Testament to the New Testament, where you have a new set of rules that humanity is, but not a completely new set, but, you know, very clearly, the only way to get to heaven is through Jesus and new Christianity. If there's a switch from an Old Testament where God let people follow certain laws that got them on under his good graces or, or God's good graces, and then eventually there was a shift to a new covenant that was a new set or, you know, a different set of rules for the most part that got people under God's good graces, who's to say there can't be a third evolution or a fourth evolution? as humanity continues to evolve. And one thing I think about, like in my mind, 
you know, you hope that humanity is moving forward. I know we see, I mean, God, I, I know there are so many terrible examples in the last like 10 years. We've seen a lot of modern humanity backsliding in so many ways, a lot of evil circulating and stuff. But I think that we are still in terms of capability, awareness, intelligence, technology, even maybe for good, for good purposes. There's a lot of good things out there that is not that are not driven by money that are actually helping people, helping people live longer, helping people have better health if they want it, if they go after it. There's so many things that we have to this day or this modern age that people didn't have back then that are clearly brought on by humanity um, or, or at least, you know, instigated from the other side. But, you know, it really took us to, to create that new realm of positivity in a lot of aspects. So who's to say that we don't get to a level where, we reach a point in like a hundred, 200 years from now where we do get our shit together and the grand galactic group of aliens, you know, million years evolve, come down and be like, ah, oh, congratulations. You know, you've reached the level, uh, or even you if it's a new religion. Three. Yeah, exactly. Or if it's a new religion, maybe, maybe God is just helping us along to get to a next level where it's Christianity 3.0 or, you know, Xanthar, whatever religion 3.0, like it's, to me, there's no arresting case. And I do, I, Chris, by the way, I do agree with you. I don't think that Christianity is um, completely going to go away and be circumvented by a totally different narrative. I think it's always, like you said, religions tend to stick around and have a central nucleus over time. But what I was trying to point out was that there are fringes. Like, for instance, you have um, like e Egyptian religion. Uh, Egyptian religion there, there are some pockets of people still, uh, worshiping Ra, I'm sure. <laughs> but, um, that is very much, uh, that went from a very centralized religion in a lot of ways to a fringe religion today where you still have some kind of ebbs and flows, things leaking over the side. But I'm just like, I think that there is room for that. I can answer the question that an I can answer as to why as a well, historian from my perspective. Okay. But the point so, is that it did happen, right? It, it, like did it did happen, and the reason that it did happen with, without um, talking about, you know, Greek expansion, <laughs> which Alexander the Great's empire, you cannot forget about that. You cannot forget about Hellenism and the incorporation of the Greek pantheon through the rulers of Ptolemy and stuff like that, even though the Egyptian gods still did remain for a very, very long time, they always considered their like queens, uh, Isis reborn or reincarnated or some aspect that I apologize if I butcher that, but you have to take into consideration. I, I could use the rise of Christianity, why that became so popular, because it's appealing to a group of people that literally have nothing they have nothing unless you went and joined the military or you happen to be born into the aristocracy or the royalty you have nothing in the roman empire you had a very very large chance of being a slave um i think the slave population within italy itself was so massive that they outnumbered citizens. And the point of Christianity was salvation. It gave you an opportunity to look forward to something. So in which those other religions really didn't, because in the ancient Egyptian faith, you're talking about your heart is weighed against a feather. And if it's not balancing out, you're going to get consumed by the alligator dog hybrid. I, I, the name escapes me, which I'm really frustrated about. So when you have a faith coming about that offers you the opportunity of salvation, a better life after you die, that's going to catch on like wildfire. And it became such a problem, especially among Roman aristocratic women, they kind of secretly followed that faith because Roman women didn't, especially, I can only speak for the aristocracy from my studies, they didn't really have much to do. They couldn't do much. 
It was always the men in control. You were kind of there. You were married off. You have a kid. Um, You know, Romans were notorious for their affairs. You had an affair here or there. But you really didn't have anything to look forward to. If you were a Roman slave, you really didn't have anything to look forward to. If you were an oppressed individual in antiquity, you really didn't have anything to look forward to. And that's why things like Christianity spread like wildfire. That's why they were burnt in the Colosseum. That's why they were killed for sport. That's why Nero, even though he burnt half of fucking Rome down, he blamed it on them. Because they challenged the established order of who was in charge. So if that makes sense, that's why certain religions would peter out. Because, okay, Zeus is not going to offer me shit. Zeus comes down in the form of a bull and, like, chases after young maidens. It's That's not going to do anything for me. But you have this concept, okay, God's son came down, he died for my sins, and if I'm a good person and I do this and I do this and this, I have the chance of a better existence in the afterlife. Yeah, I'm going to take that chance. And that's from like from from my historical perspective my opinion as a historian of why something you would see the death of these religions now obviously you can talk about zealots that will physically go and wipe these people out but for the most part that's something that you know your average person would be attracted to especially someone that has like no money they don't have anything i farm all day and I, I literally break my back to survive. There's got to be something better after this. You know what's fascinating about that idea? Before I toss it back over to Dave for any inputs, but <clears throat> think, imagine a future where um, people ask the same question. Technologically, we have you know we have modern uh, modern problems, but we all st- we still have very much a psychological need. The core at our very psychology, the the requirements that we have, what's that pyramid? I forget what it's called, but it's like, you know, safety, self-assurance or whatever. So we all still have those needs. Um, And then also we have that very real question about what happens after we die. And that's always going to be there, right? Like it doesn't, you can, you can try to convince that somebody a million times over, you have proof of something happening after you die. Doesn't matter. You're still your own person within your own conscious. You can't prove anything outside of your own conscious. For, for certain. So I think that that is still going to be an equation for people, no matter how much time goes by. But imagine a time in the future, the near future, where that traditional religion doesn't satisfy people anymore to give them what they want. They need um, something to form the narrative that makes more sense in a, in a technological environment where we're starting to get out into space. We're starting to see these vast discovery or these vast realms being discovered. And and even internally at the smallest degree where like, it, I don't know if you guys realize, or I'm sure you realize, but no one talked about during COVID, I would literally, I would open up my phone every other day and I would read an amazing news article about some kind of crazy discovery that was going by the wayside because COVID was at the headlines. Like we've made so much technological and scientific advancements in the last 10 years. I can't even imagine what the next 10 years, save 100 years from now, is going to look like. So I think when people face that, there very well could be a, a, a deep-seated desire to break out into a new perspective or a new narrative, given the vastness of the the explana- or the uh, exploration that could happen um, when we leave the Earth to, to go out with our ships or even just go to Mars or something like that. It's going to happen eventually, as long as we don't wipe ourselves out first. I don't know, Dave, what, what's like, as you were hearing all of these perspectives, I'm sure it's just like probably have like way, like a wave of things uh, to talk about, but I just want to toss it back to you to see if you have anything to, to throw our way. Yeah. And you know, this is what I love about your show, by the way, and why we loved having you on the rundown was the perspective that you guys come at this and the questions you're asking are interesting, right? It's thoughtful. It's not just canned questions, right? I. Uh, when when I look so first to take it back briefly to the idea of like the Christianity 3.0 um my views one of the things that I like to say I say it to my my kids sometimes uh when they're like well why would god do this and 
why is that okay? You know, we don't get to, I don't think we get to put limitations on God, right? So I think when I look at the the stories in scripture and the tradition and everything from Judaism up to now, and and as JJ will tell you, some of these stories preceded Judaism, uh, Job being an, an example, but I think there's others. Uh, I think what you're seeing, if you follow, let's say, the the view of the garden and Adam and Eve, from the point that that fell apart, I think that God has put in place a creation with a set of principles that he wants to follow. And over time, we either do or we don't that, do that as a society. Saying that God is omniscient and knows everything is different than saying that God is guiding every little step, right? He's not, I don't think he's up there saying, okay, well, today, David's going to go left when he pulls out of the neighborhood, and then he's going to say hi to this person, and then he's going to have a car wreck. Okay, I, I think that God is like, okay, you have free will, you have choices, you get to make them, and you get to suffer the consequences. And hey, every now and then, I'm going to give you a little help, right? I'm going to give you a little bit of a lift. And I think he does that. I've certainly seen that in my life um, and even in my kid's life. So I think that's different than saying God knows everything and therefore he's decided everything that happens. And so I think when you look at the history and the Bible and the, the history afterwards, well, the things that have happened, the different iterations through Christianity, I think that's what you're seeing play out is God's system he has set up and he's watching, and he sees it, and he's nudging here and there. And when he says it's going all to hell in a handbasket, you know, he wipes everybody out with a flood. <laughs> and so I think that's the way it works. And I, I think that that's what Christ was. I think he was a, okay, we need to make some changes and take this to the next level. But I don't think that is... uh has to be the last step. And people who want to hold God to, okay, and it says in Revelation, and then this is the end. There is no more. Um, I, I don't think that's the way it's got to be. So it's it's hard to say, but I, I think that you could have your Christianity 3.0. And, you know, we are, as a society, advancing in, at a huge, huge pace. And I totally get that. It, it is incredible. And it's exciting to be living in a time where that advancement is happening so quickly. But one other thing that I would say is you talked about the psychology, the psychological need for something like religion. And I think it's a spiritual need, not a psychological one. You can express it in psychology, but I think it's deeper than that. I think it's in our souls. I think there is a need for God. I think there is deeply embedded in us that searching and that wanting to know, and that wanting to know what happens when we die. And that's why you have paranormal investigators. That is why we do what we do, is that drive to know. And the first time you get an EVP or you get touched or the flashlight turns on when you tell it to. I mean, we used to have flashlights. We tell it turn blue on, blue one on, and it turned the blue one on, it turned the red one on, it turned the red one on. You know, when you have that kind of interaction, it's like, oh yeah, there is something beyond what we see and feel. And that is one more uh stone on the side of the scale for there's life after death and there's there's meaning in life it's not just what we experience there's more to it i'm 100 percent on board with you i think that like it's all within the realm of possible and that's the most dif difficult part at the end of the day especially like talking about god and uh what could possibly happen 
um, from any perspective. And, and, and just also the, uh, the idea that there might not even be a God, there could be God's, or there could be some other different force that we can not attribute it to uh, like a single, um, beings awareness or whatever, like, you know, even if it's omniscient, omnipresent, but I, I there's two more things I have to share and you guys can continue. I, I have to run uh, in a couple minutes, but I will share something that, that really intrigued me that Dave, you kind of, um, led the path towards when you were talking earlier, you were saying how you had this aha moment, so to speak, where you, you, um, rejected Satan and you came, came closer to your, uh, Christian religion, which, you know, it's a beautiful story. I mean, like, I, I think that like having that experience is very rare for all of humanity. So if you have any religion, having anybody have an experience like that is awesome for me. Um, I have to say that when I was younger, before I was exposed to religion, before I was exposed to any uh, ideologies or, or belief structures, when I was just a little kid sitting outside in my mom's backyard, and I was looking up at the stars, feeling the warm summer breeze on my face, and not a care in the world. I know things are different because you get older, you have responsibilities, and that's that's a big part of it. But that feeling that I still I want to hold on to, to the day I die, that was the most true visceral reality that I, I really would hope that everybody would get to experience at some point in their life. But it's obviously that's not how life works. Everybody has different experiences, even from the day they're born. Some people don't even get close to having that experience. But for some reason, I had that experience where for years when I was young, I just had this weird feeling of connection to the universe and, you know, just open and whole and um, I would especially get it when I looked up at the stars at night and just contemplating the vastness of it all and stuff like that. And I think that I would like to believe that that's a similar feeling that you got. That's a similar feeling that a lot of people get when they have that relig- religious experience. It doesn't matter what religion it is. When you really feel you appreciate your existence and other people's existences, and you want that base level peace for everybody. And, and that, you know, I, I could hear people, some people out there rolling their eyes like, oh, come on, man, that's not how life works. But I'm telling you, like, <laughs> I had that feeling when I was a kid and I hope I never forget it. And I've made mistakes throughout my life. And I sometimes I've gotten further away from that. And I try to get closer to it. It's hard when you get older. Um, but I think that if I can have that feeling without organized religion, I think that it's very possible that some higher being that orchestrated that level of, of awareness and feeling as a, as a human being could make different pathways to get to that level. And it doesn't matter if you're Christian or Muslim or Egyptian or whatever, like whatever religion you followed, I, I can never imagine a being that can create that feeling in a little kid staring up the stars would care uh, that this person follows the wrong religion than this person. And they're going to just banish them all. And it's only just this one sphere of religion that matters. Um, I, I think that there really are different pathways to get to that feeling. And, and the last thing I'll say is I could be fuck all wrong. I could be completely wrong. Maybe there is one true religion and I'm just smiting myself by spewing out this bullshit that was completely imagined as a kid. Who knows? Um, but that's, that's my last thought. You guys feel free to bounce around and I'm definitely going to be interested in hearing, um, this whole podcast and whatever you guys have. So Dave, we, uh, had a long winded discussion with Dean about the evolution of religion and God and all that fun conversation. Uh, listeners, Dean had to step away. So it's just uh, me and Dave for the rest of the show. So Dave, I wanted to ask your perspective going back to demons and the paranormal and whatnot. What is in your opinion, what, difference has have you seen between protestantism and catholicism when it comes to the paranormal and demons yeah it's fascinating i came from a very protestant background right i i think i dated a girl who went to who was catholic so i've been to a catholic church once in my life when i was younger otherwise you know it was uh baptist presbyterian southern baptist uh, mostly Southern Baptist and Lutheran, Methodist, uh, different family members, grandparents and stuff. So I've always come at it from that perspective. And growing up, when I look back at that experience, all of the talk was about the devil, right? 
there's not a focus on demons. Uh, and now I can't speak for all Protestants, right? Because you you have a whole bunch of you know you got charismatics. Now charismatics will will definitely have more uh, demonic stuff included in their beliefs, right? Because they have a deliverance ministry built into it. Uh, and there are some really smaller sects up in the mountains and such that, you know, like the people that hold the snakes and, and all that, uh, where I think you'll probably see more of a focus on, on demons. But from a, a mainstream Protestant standpoint, it's not a focus. That said, uh, at least on the Southern Baptist side, I think if you were to ask any serious Southern Baptist, are there demons, they would go, yeah, and I don't like to talk about that stuff. I don't want to focus on the negative. Do they do things like exorcism? Yeah, I think they do. They have deliverance in some capacity. It's not something that is talked about a lot, and it's not something that is... Uh, you know, on the the menu of things that you see in in church, right? You know, just like confession's not there. You don't see confession, and well, they don't have confession. But you, know, it, exorcism is certainly not something that you would typically hear about in a church environment in the Protestants. That said, I think they believe in them. I just don't think it, they think of it as as something that they want to spend a lot of time on. And you've got a lot of uh, little C Catholic churches that do, right? I, when I say little C, I mean not, uh, you know, recognized by the Pope, not recognized by Rome. You've got some slight differences in belief. You, you know, often they have apostolic succession, so they trace back to a a bishop that left the Roman Catholic Church but they are not a member of it. Uh, now, a lot of those, and I know some priests with that, uh, that do have uh, exorcism practices in their in their beliefs. So whenever you get closer to that Catholic line, the closer you're going to see to demons. You know, it was interesting. Uh, you often hear Protestants talk about uh, how the Catholics... Re uh, added books into the Bible. And uh, I, I got my first Catholic Bible last year with the, uh, the Apocrypha. In it. And it's the, it's the Apocrypha, right? That's, man, I get my terms mixed up. Um, you have the Pseudepigrapha and the Apocrypha. The Pseudepigrapha, I think, are the books that are unknown. They were supposedly uh, original authors, but weren't. Like, uh, the Gospel of Thomas, and so on. And I think the Apocrypha is what the Protestant, what Luther pulled out of the Bible. So I got my first book, and I started reading through these books, trying to see, well, what is the big deal? What's the to-do about these books? Why were they removed? And one of them is the Book of Tobit. In fact, that was the first one that I read. And it was fascinating, because that book had a demon in it, who was, uh, man, Azazel, of Billy J.J. J.J. says I said it right. Yeah. No, J.J., <laughs> it's Azazel. <laughs> I know. That's what I tell him every time now. I just do it to just really get him his, his blood pressure up. But Azazel was in it and, you know, is this this woman in every man she wants to marry dies, so you actually have a demon killing people. And you have in it a uh, an angel comes down, an archangel, and appears as a person and plays out as part of the story and, and gives a recipe that includes like the gallbladder of a fish or something that gets made into incense to use as part of an exorcism. Now, maybe that's why that book was pulled. 
because they didn't want this focus on demons. It's it's certainly a book that supports the act of exorcism and the agency that demons have in our everyday lives. And and I think that that's fascinating. So do the Protestants believe that they exist? Yes. Do, are they super active? No, they don't focus on that. Uh, I, I think that's the way I see it. And obviously they go to the Catholics to get exorcisms when whatever they do doesn't work. <laughs> that's a that's a interesting that you bring that up. I like to make that joke anytime I'm watching a show like I'm I'm I don't know if you've seen the show called A Haunting that mm-hmm. used to run from like the late 90s and they revived it and it's such yep. a good show. I I I enjoy it. Anytime there's like a specific case and it's like, "Oh, well, Sounds like you got a demon here. You got to go talk to the Catholic Church. That's right. <laughs> it, it always, it's like, okay, all right, we're not going to bother with this. Like, you, you got to go talk to the Catholics. I, I always found that funny. That even though there's, you know, a little bit of contention there because of the past, um, there's still an understanding like, okay, we're not really equipped to deal with this. Um, there's another group that can help you. Yeah. Well, I mean, they've got, They've got the training. They actually, you know, they do, they train exorcists. They send them, you know, a lot of times to Rome for classes. And they have all of the, you know, the history to pass down to these guys on what to do and how to do it. And, you know, they still have the the Roman ritual. Uh, They've updated it. And. So a lot of the stuff that I follow, a lot of the, you know, the stuff that I've learned is from, from, you know, podcasts and videos from actual, you know, Roman Catholic exorcists. And that's probably what makes me lean more Catholic, right? I mean, one of the things that helped during my experience when, when this demon was in the room every night was... My wife's best friend is Catholic, and she was talking to her about it, and she got her a little medicine bottle full of holy water and brought it home, and I put that on the nightstand, and it was immediate. That night forward, this thing was weaker. It would still show up, but it wasn't as strong. It wasn't as dark. It didn't have as much feeling of hatred. Now, is that my mind? Uh putting it on that maybe although i wasn't catholic so you know is that am, at the time am i thinking that this is this is my salvation is this bottle of water you know n- not much more than a thimble right no that's not what i was thinking i was thinking well you know i'll try anything <laughs> this really sucks and i'd really like it to go away so yeah the the actual practice you know i've Father Bird songs, Exorcist. A uh, lot of conversations with him, and and some of the the episodes that will come out in my podcast are interviews with him about process and cases and stuff like that. It, it's there's a rich tradition in the Catholic Church that has stayed on exorcism, and they are definitely beyond a doubt the experts. The only people that would consider themselves, I think. Uh, as knowledgeable would maybe be the charismatics because they look at it differently, not from a uh, super rigid ritual standpoint, but from a practice standpoint of of being able to do deliverance. I got a couple of questions before we wrap up here, or we could go longer if you want. But <laughs> so that experience that you had, that demonic experience, would you say that's what brought you back? I don't want to say brought you back, but kind of, you know, violently shoved you into your faith again. Yes, 100%. One of the things that that we've talked about amongst the guys in the rundown frequently is the belief and why God lets bad things happen, right? Uh, We've done episodes on, you know, theodicy and you know 
the evil that God allows to be in the world, stuff like that. There is, you know, this this idea that God uses terrible things to accomplish improvements in our face, to bring us closer to God. And I absolutely believe that that's what happened here. I certainly believe that, you know, we talked just earlier, we were talking about the idea that is, does God allow things to happen or is God causing things to happen? Right? That idea, just because he's omniscient doesn't mean that he's causing every single thing to occur. That said, if I flip that around and say, he could stop anything that he wants to stop. So, I think that's what happened in my case. I think that my experience, God kept from becoming too serious. From the very beginning of this, that renouncement of Satan, I never felt in danger, right? I never felt like, oh, I need to go see a priest about being possessed. That never felt like a risk to me. I felt, and I think this was God's will, that it would never be allowed to go that far. It was one of the reasons I think that I felt this thing hated me so much. It was because it knew it wasn't allowed to take me. and. That said, God allowed some pretty bad stuff to happen in my life during that experience. And it wasn't fun. It, it was not this, you know, beautiful come to Jesus experience. It was a really intense experience where I'm like, there's got to be something more on the good side to balance this thing out and a search for my faith with God. So I think God used the whole experience to bring me closer to him. Yeah, I, I can actually resonate with that because when I was on the rundown, I gave you guys a couple of examples of what I went through growing up in that haunted house. And I, I mentioned earlier in the podcast that, you know, I was an atheist for a little while. Mm. And then you go through what you go through and it's like, okay. Let me take a step back. If there's something negative, there has to be something positive to counteract it. Now, given that my mom, born and raised the Roman Catholic, that's how she raised me, that's kind of what I defaulted to. If I was, if she was Protestant, it would, I would probably be Protestant right now. So uh, I'm not saying that one is better than the other, but it's just kind of what I defaulted to, you know, based off of experience but i i i can definitely uh empathize with um what you went through uh i'm glad i didn't see anything my sister saw stuff right and my cousin saw stuff and you know what you described as this like seven eight foot tall black mass like they saw that i yeah. didn't see that i felt it but it's, you know, I will say that I know Dean and I, we joke around on the show, you know, we're a little lighthearted, you know, skeptical approach. He's a little more skeptical than I am. And he always makes a joke that, you know, he kind of wants to have a paranormal encounter. And I always say that it's not something you really want to happen because it's one of those things that you can't explain. You tend to keep it to yourself. Because unless you're around like-minded people, people are going to look at you like, this dude is a fucking whack job. Like, I, <laughs> I, 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 like we don't want to associate, you know, with them. And that's why, like, I enjoy talking with yourself, Vic, and JJ. And just recently, I talked to Father Birdsong on a podcast a few weeks ago. That's why I enjoy having these discussions because, you know, you're, you're in a space in which you're not going to be judged. You're going to have this type of discussion in which you can throw and bounce around these ideas. I did kind of have a, a kind of a curveball question for you from your perspective. 
you believe that God put you through that experience with that demon to kind of push you closer to him. But for the, for instance, okay, like the Holocaust, for example, why, or how would you rationalize that in a sense of like, okay, there are certain things that God can do, but he can't directly intervene as much as he wants to. Oh no. So, so I don't put limits on God. So I think that if God snapped his fingers, the Holocaust wouldn't have happened. I think that's, you know, his right as God. So that said, why did he allow it to happen? Why does he allow something horrible? Well, you know, God has allowed or even proposed, asked for horrible things to happen in the past. You know, look at Exodus. When they went into Canaan, he said, wipe out all the Canaanites. Not just the fighting men, all the Canaanites. Women, children, fighting men. Everything. Animals, everything. Yep, everything. You know, that's what he wanted. Now, God gets to see the big picture. That's that whole omniscient thing. So he knows what that may have stopped or helped if they had done it. And that perspective is not one that we can see. Uh, the Holocaust. Maybe there's some purpose. Maybe the Holocaust is what drives the the Jews to be able to rebuild the temple at some point. You know, maybe that's what brought the Jewish state back together. I mean, it seemed to. I, I don't know. Was that the best way to allow it to happen? I, I, I don't know. I don't have that perspective. We can't see the whole board. We only see the little slice that we're in and the little bits of history that we're allowed to know just from, you know, school and right. books. So right. I, I, I think that it's a situation where, yeah, there's some, some pretty horrible stuff that's been allowed to happen. But if it didn't happen, maybe there was even more store horrible stuff. And there is this free will idea. Right, and there's this idea of original sin, and it has consequences, and those consequences range beyond your own personal life. If you believe in original sin, then we're all dealing with the consequences of Adam and his choice. So, his choice is affecting generation after generation after generation, billions of people. Trillions of people. I don't know how many people have lived, but a bunch. And God has allowed that to be a consequence. You know? But in the end, I, I, I don't know. No, that's a fair answer. I wasn't trying to be facetious with that questioning. Or no, I didn't think you were. No, it's a serious question, like serious that. answer. Absolutely. Because it's a question I've asked myself. Like, okay, like, why are certain bad things allowed to happen? Like, why isn't there some sort of intervention you know what i mean like why isn't there this big hand just coming down and picking up yeah whatever evil dictator and just like you know like squashing them like a bug type of thing but yeah like you said no you can't really put limitations and it's kind of beyond our understanding absolutely and that is you'll one of the arguments you'll hear against christianity uh and and other religions too i imagine is well you know how can a just god allow children to suffer how can he allow you know people to be crippled and this and that and it's a fair question it's not it's it's not an unreasonable question that said if God made life to where there was no suffering and we all lived perfect lives, well, what would be the point? Right? If you, <laughs> one of my favorite movies is The Matrix. All right? So if you go back to The Matrix, when they're the long discussion with Mr. Smith and Morpheus, 
in the the room at the top of the building. He's like, you know, this isn't the first Matrix. The first Matrix was perfect. And we gave you everything. And you rejected it. Right? Couldn't believe it was possible. Well, suffering is built into the human experience. Suffering of some type. And whether you experience that suffering for a few short years as a child, or over a long lifespan as an adult, or some people don't have to experience the suffering, you know? Those are all different experiences. And I think that if you don't let there be those experiences, if you put guardrails around it, then you're creating a world that doesn't have character. Now, to the person suffering, I'm sure that does not seem like a fair thing. Right? I've had the health problems. I've had my own amount of suffering. I get it. But that suffering that I've experienced is part of who I am. And without it, I would be a completely different person. Is that good or bad? I don't know. And I have one final question for you tonight, Dave, before I let you go. We're kind of pushing two and a half hours here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, no, I no, can no, talk. no, 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 no. It's not, not, not your fault at all. Um, it, it's just been a fun conversation that one of, Good. one of the fun conversations that for I've me too. in a little bit. I appreciate that. Um, so this is a question I like to ask all of my guests to kind of wrap up. Um, and the question is for people that go throughout their lives experiencing the paranormal, but they pretend it doesn't exist. Why do you think folks like that tend to um, behave in that manner? Where it's like, okay, you have someone that's literally their entire lives. They, they see stuff, they experience stuff, they hear things, but it's like, you know what? I'm not going to deal with, it. no, it doesn't exist. I don't want to talk about it. Why, why do you think certain people take that stance or are, or are outright skeptical, even though they've been presented like, you know, personal evidence with what they've experienced or someone has provided them with evidence, if that makes sense. Yeah, so there's there's a couple aspects to this. One is society is not very forgiving, right? It, it's much more forgiving now than it was a hundred years ago, fifty years ago. You know, if, if you started telling all your friends fifty, sixty years ago that you see ghosts at night, you know. They're like, okay, let's call up the doctor. You know, it's time for the loony bin. Um, it, it's, it was a very small set of society that would acknowledge and talk about these things, general society, at least in the United States. Now, it's different in some other countries. So it's a cultural thing, for one thing, that can, can suppress that. And, and culture is powerful. People want to fit into culture, and so they might suppress it for that reason. Uh, it can be scary. You know, I know someone who had a very terrifying personal experience at one of the sites that we were at. They saw people there as they were when they died, and it scared the, it scared them to the point where they wouldn't investigate again. It was that terrifying of an experience. It was too real. And that's understandable, right? It can be scary. And it's not for everybody. I think if you experience the paranormal, if you're seeing entities and you're having activity at your house or wherever you go and you deny it, you're doing it for one of two reasons. Either you don't believe yourself, you think that it's not real, or it's too real and you just don't want to accept it. It's easier to not accept that it's happening, uh, which is also understandable. 
I mean, if you're dealing with stuff that all the time, it could be frustrating. It could be annoying. You know, we have <laughs> we have had activity at the house where I don't even pay attention to it, right? And and something will happen, and it's like you know, wow, you know, for the past couple of days, something has been hanging around because I've heard a knock here, uh, you know, stuffs disappeared, reappeared somewhere else. I don't know. But yeah, now it all makes sense because I just tune it out. I, I would just, I, I'm so uh, in my mind trained to ignore activity when it happens so as not to feed it. Right? If I'm helping somebody, if I'm trying to help somebody who's got a problem, which I don't do a lot of, uh, but somebody who's got a problem, with something at their house, right? The first go-to immediately is ignore it. Don't pay any attention to it. See if it goes away. Because the more you pay attention to it, you pull out the cameras, you put down a recorder. Now it's got a, a platform to display itself on, right? Now it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to show itself. So you're going to have more activity. Well. If you don't want that, you just learn to ignore it. And then if it doesn't go away, then you start other options as far as trying to get rid of it. But I can easily see how someone who maybe had stuff that started when they were young and they were scared of it or just didn't like it chooses very early on to ignore it. And you can train your mind to do that. You'll Unless it's really severe, you'll just put blinders on, walk right past it. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Now, if you're out there sitting there, deny, 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 and you've got stuff happening, you either don't trust yourself or you just don't want to believe it. Thank you for tuning into today's episode of The Wandering Road. If you enjoyed today's episode, please give us a rating on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please share the show with your friends, as that would help us grow immensely. Also be sure to follow us on social media. You can find us on TikTok at TWR Podcast, our Instagram at TW Road Podcast, and our Facebook by searching for The Wandering Road Podcast. If you'd like to get a hold of us, you can reach us at our email address, twroadpodcast at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. We would love to have you on the show as a guest so you can share your stories or you could submit email submissions of your stories that we could dedicate an episode to. Thanks, and we'll catch you on the next one.